Ms. Yu, please make yourself comfortable and we'll be on our way. Transtar facility is just a short hop. 78 degrees, clear skies all the way. That's a nice view on the bay there. I did not expect to like Prey as much as I did. It has some very cool concepts behind it, but the developers failed to execute them to completion. And that's fine. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have studios try to do something different and fail, than play it safe. And the weird thing is that Prey is good not despite of its flaws, but because of them. I usually start my videos with a joke or a montage poking fun at the game I'm reviewing, but Prey... Prey doesn't deserve my cynical snark. It deserves a scenic flight through retro-futuristic San Francisco while I'm struggling to find my words. So yeah, welcome to Prey. Here we are, Ms. Yu. Mind the glass on the way out. Good luck to you. Prey 2017 takes place in 2032, in an alternate timeline where President Kennedy survives his assassination. The failed attempt at his life prompts Kennedy to direct more funding into the space program, accelerating the space race and triggering an era of technological innovation. Another point of divergence in Prey's timeline is the existence of the Soviet Union. Books and articles found throughout the game imply that not only is the Soviet Union a major world power well into the 2030s, but also that, ideologically speaking, it's still stuck in the 50s and 60s. So this means no Brezhnev stagnation and perestroika and that gulags are still a thing. In a The Man in the High Castle style twist of events, you can find an ad about an alternative history novel that explores what would have happened if Kennedy decided to go to war with the Soviets in the 60s. But I'm getting sidetracked, I just wanted to share this cool detail with you guys. Anyway, sometime after the failed assassination, a species of aliens called the Typhon is discovered on the Sputnik 1. The Soviets and the Americans then decide to put the Cold War on hold and work together to fight off the Typhon threat. This led to the creation of Kletka, a space station situated in orbit around the moon whose purpose was to serve as a prison for the aliens. In 1964, the United States pays for the rights to use Kletka as a testing facility. After a series of geopolitical events spanning several decades, in 2025 the newly established Transtar Corporation buys and privatizes Kletka. 2030 sees the inauguration of Talos 1 and the release of the first Neuromod. A Neuromod is a performance enhancement tool that changes the structure of the user's brain based on the template copied from a person with the relevant skills. For instance, a Neuromod created from a scan of Never Knows Best would allow me to articulate my ideas better and give me a suave English accent. Fast forward to present day. It's Monday, March 15, 2042. Location, San Francisco, California. You are Morgan Yu, a freshly employed Transtar engineer and the sibling of Alex Yu, a researcher on Talos 1. After waking up to a retro synthwave track, you dress up, trash your apartment and terrorize the electrician, as one usually does on a Monday morning. You then head over to your private helicopter to meet up with your brother at Transtar HQ to take a series of tests prior to leaving for Talos 1. You go into the testing chambers where you're greeted by a group of researchers who ask you to complete a series of simple tasks. Move this, press that, hide behind a chair. Ah, I get it, it's a tutorial. Suddenly one of the scientists is attacked by an alien and you fall unconscious. It's Monday, March 15, 2032. Location, San Francisco, California. You are Morgan Yu, a freshly employed wa Wait, what the fuck? Something's off. The music's different. Emails urge you to run. Furniture and objects are in different positions. Somebody pulled the Stasi on your room. You dress up and head out into the lobby. The electrician is dead. You head back to your apartment. You break the glass hoping to make an escape through the balcony. Good. You're in the simulation lot. It was a fucking simulation all along. Oh well. 
At least the ruse is up and now you can focus on escaping this fucking place. Maybe you'll grab a nice cup of coffee while contacting the San Francisco Chronicle. Somebody has to know about this shit, right? So you kill a few aliens, go through the decontamination room into the Neuromod division and... You've been on Talus 1 all along. You absolute fucking buffoon. This is one of the best openings I've ever experienced. The music, the dialogue, the foreshadowing, the tension, the build-up. I could gush over it for the rest of the video, but I can't do that without going into full spoiler territory. But here's the question. Does the rest of the game live up to its strong opening? Well, yes and no. Mostly yes. Here's a question that I totally didn't ask to sneakily encourage viewers to leave comments and boost this video in the algorithm. In your opinion, what is THE defining characteristic of an arcane game? Is it the emergent gameplay? The lore? The lack of a strong main story? Because for me personally, it's how all of their games have a consistent visual identity. According to the backstory, Talos 1 was originally built in the 1960s, but has been repurposed many times since then. So as a result of this, the station includes a wide mix of architectural designs spanning many decades, from the lobby's bold contrasting colors reminiscent of early art deco to the mid-century Soviet-inspired brutalist design of the station's laboratories. But Arcane's attention to detail extends to the furnishings and interior styling as well. Most of the furnishings were inspired by 60s interior design magazines and catalogs. To give you just a quick example, the lamps are inspired by a Bauhaus lamp design created by Wilhelm Wagenfeld. Its lounges and recreation rooms resemble the damp and smoky jazz clubs you'd see in Mad Men. You can almost picture Don Draper there. Unfortunately for Don, the upgrade tree makes no mention of skills such as cheating on your spouse or hitting on waitresses, so it's safe to assume that he wouldn't survive a day. All of these things are, of course, infused with a heavy dose of retrofuturism. The visual language of the game points to a world culturally stuck in the 60s, a world nostalgic about mid-century kitchen designs, day drinking and indoor smoking that has an almost comical and, dare I say, naive enthusiasm for modernity. The most striking examples of 60s nostalgia are found in the posters. The posters produced by the Trendstar Corporation sport influences both from Art Deco as well as 60s advertisements. Call me crazy, but I'd go a step further and speculate that the designers also took inspiration from Russian avant-garde imagery. Here's a relatively recent example of a modern usage of this style. I'd be surprised if Arcane didn't have at least one diehard Franz Ferdinand fan, because boy, some of these posters gave me huge Take Me Out vibes. Now that I've firmly established my indie rock cred, let's talk a bit about the world design. One of the things that my fellow YouTube hobbyist Paul, go check out his podcast, pointed out while we were talking about Prey was the geographical cohesiveness of its world. To exemplify, the game proper starts in the simulation labs. What struck me about this area was how it manages to explain the logistics behind the simulation through its environment. Remember the hallway where you first saw the electrician? Upon closer inspection, you'll notice some peculiar drag marks implying the existence of a revolving wall of some sort. Right next to the elevator, you'll notice another set of drag marks, which seem to originate from the soles of a person's boots, most likely Morgans while they were dragged from the testing chambers to their bed. The fish tank from the hallway leads to a corridor that connects the simulation lab to the decontamination area. The elevator that you take to the helipad, which is now walled off, and the one from Trendstar HQ are one and the same. Even the helicopter is fake. The simulation is so comically cheap that you can't help but admire the confidence of the people who created it. They were so confident you'd fall for it day after day after day that they didn't even bother to wipe the drag marks from the floors. I could go on, but you get the idea. This entire area is a masterclass in visual storytelling. Just by exploring and paying attention to my surroundings, I found out everything I needed to know about the simulation and how it worked. Next up is the Neuromod division. This section includes two floors, the luxurious foyer, foyer and the second story, which is accessible only to employees. Upon exiting the Neuromod division, you end up in this gargantuan multi-purpose lobby. 
It's both the main hub of the station, connecting to all major locations, as well as a sort of visitor center and office space all in one. It includes a museum, a sales division, HR, hospital, security, IT security, a rec center, the executive offices where all the big shots pretend to work while considering whether or not to leave their spouses for their secretaries, and so on and so forth. A quick ride with the elevator will take you to the Arboretum. Arcane must have taken Mr. B. Tong's video essay to heart because the first major building you encounter is the greenhouse. So right from the get-go, Prey answers the age-old question of what do they eat? The Arboretum connects to the crew quarters, where employees go to chill, watch a movie, work out, enjoy a nice dinner or a concert and sleep. This is my absolute favorite area from Prey. Along with giving me huge Bioshock vibes, I was yet again struck by how much care and effort and love Arcane puts into designing their worlds. I wish they'd make a story-driven DLC of some sort set in this location, maybe set just prior to Talos 1 becoming an inhospitable alien infested shithole. I'd love to get a glimpse of the station's day-to-day -day life before the alien outbreak. It doesn't even have to contain combat, just let me play as Janice from HR or something. Imagine a frustration meter filling up as you're trying to organize a team building exercise last minute. Oh shit, that game already exists. It's called Karen. I'd also like a mini game where you have to accept or reject a set number of job applications within a fixed time limit. It would work like papers, please. You'd also get bonus points for including the right amount of buzzwords in your emails. Right sourcing, employer value proposition, inclusive workforce, work-life integration, out-of-the-box thinking, millennials, we care about the well-being of our employee. But do you know when I was truly blown away by the world design? The moment I ventured outside into space. Seeing the space station from the outside really puts things into perspective. As you can see from the footage, the scale of this thing is quite impressive. Moreover, the locations of the airlocks match the interior layout, so it's not just window dressing. What's more, you're free to venture outside whenever you feel like it and explore the surroundings. The airlocks are essentially fast travel points. Well, fast travel is a polite way to put it, as you'll have to endure the atrocious... Uh... Floating speed? And the clunky controls. Still, I have to give props to Arcane here. They didn't have to make the Talos 1 exterior explorable. Normally, such a location would be reserved to short main story moments. From a genre perspective, pre-2017 is surprisingly hard to label. It may look like an FPS RPG hybrid, but the combat is generally very defensive in nature and the RPG mechanics are bare bones. The first half of the game plays like a survival horror, but the tension wears off as you're upgrading the relevant skills and mastering the game's resource-based economy. To make things even more confusing, Prey has the DNA of an immersive sim, but it falls flat around the third act due to certain design and balancing issues. So let's start from the assumption that Prey is an immersive sim. Did I feel immersed? Fuck yeah, I did! That was the last one! Well, that's some fine shooting, if I do say so myself. While Prey borrows numerous gameplay concepts from System Shock, Thief and Dishonored, the game itself is a spiritual slash mechanical slash thematic successor to Ark's Fatalis, Arcane's debut title which served as the template for their subsequent games. Much like Ark's Fatalis, Prey features a sprawling, interconnected dungeon that players can explore to their heart's content so long as they possess the relevant skills and items. This space dungeon, as the developers themselves called it, is filled with various aggressive creatures and hazards that players can overcome through a multitude of ways. One of the first enemies you'll encounter are the Mimics, a species of shape-shifting aliens that can disguise themselves into inanimate objects. These annoying space cockroaches make the early game feel very tense as you'll spend the first 10 hours hitting every single object with your wrench like a coked-up Morgan Freeman. It's an Interesting mechanic that prevents players from impulsively grabbing everything they see and adds an additional layer of tension to resource management, which is a vital part of the early game. It's also a great way to fuck with the player's mind. I'm frankly embarrassed by the amount of medkits and supplies I've destroyed thinking they're mimics. Speaking of fucking with one's mind, this is one of the few examples of games that nail psychological horror. 
It's not necessarily scary, oppressive would be a more accurate term. You won't shit your pants or anything like that, but it will make you feel paranoid, unsettled and anxious. In fact, Arkane restricted how many horror elements they would include, opting to focus more on atmosphere instead. Think Stalker, but replace the howls of drunk Ukrainians with the clanking of a decaying space station. Sadly, getting jumped by Mimics loses its luster quickly. You'll eventually view them more as pests than menacing aliens. But there's more to tell us once diverse alien ecosystem than the Mimics. Shortly after entering the lobby for the first time, you'll notice the crooked, shadowy silhouette of a Typhon that mumbles something about being alone in the universe, as if it's rehearsing for a slam poetry competition. That's a phantom. I like to call it the emo alien. But unlike your regular emos, instead of badgering you to give Cap and Jazz a shot for the hundredth time, they kill you. Which is arguably better. They come in many variants like the other aliens. Some shoot bolts of electricity, others teleport, while others do… stuff. But don't worry, that's what a glue gun is for. You can use the glue gun to stun the aliens and finish them off with your shotgun, pistol or wrench. We'll get back to the glue gun a little later. There's another enemy type called the telepath. These serve as mini bosses in prey and boy are they annoying as shit. They don't attack you directly. They control hordes of mind slaves that are aware of their enslavement but are powerless to do anything against it. When you get too close to a telepath, they cower into a corner and trigger the slave's heads to explode. The easiest way to defeat a telepath is to knock its slaves unconscious with a stun gun and go to town on them with the shotgun. Throwing an all-wave grenade can be just as effective as it stuns the telepath for a few seconds, giving you just enough time to pump a few free shots into them. But that's not all. Meeting certain conditions will spawn this huge tentacled chad of an alien called the Nightmare. You have two choices here. Either try to kill it, which you'll fail at, or cower under a desk until the timer runs out. Ah, fuck. Prey has some light RPG elements in the form of the upgrade tree. There are three categories initially, with an additional three added halfway through the game when you unlock the Typhon powers. For this playthrough I decided to completely ignore Typhon powers and focus on human abilities. There's a lot to unpack here, so I'm just gonna focus on the abilities I've used the most. So first you've got your standard health and damage upgrades. The first one is pretty self-explanatory. The latter is a bit convoluted and I'm only explaining this because it took me a while to figure it out. Under the engineer tree you can find the gunsmith perk. This allows you to upgrade your security weapons past the first level. I had tons of weapon upgrade kits clogging my inventory, so it seemed like a pretty sensible investment at the time. So I maxed out gunsmith, upgraded my shotgun to max level, but my damage output was still subpar. Soon after I finally discovered why my shotgun felt like a pea shooter, I hadn't invested any points into firearms. It's under the security tree, so it's very easy to miss. The second level of this ability raises gun damage and critical hit chance to 150 and 10% respectively. Essentially, you get more out of each bullet with every subsequent upgrade. And considering ammo is hard to come by and expensive to fabricate, it's a pretty sweet deal. Another ability I recommend you pick up is Leverage. It's an ability that allows Morgan to pick up, move and hurl heavy objects. Lower tiers of Leverage can be used to move obstructions, so you can throw a Leverage 2 object to push a Leverage 3 object out of the way. The final tier of Leverage allows Morgan to open unpowered doors through sheer force, 
The third tier is not necessary as every location has multiple entryways and you can use a recycling charge to remove debris and obstructions anyway. The suit modification skill chain provides Morgan with extra inventory space and allows the installation of additional chipsets. You only have a limited amount of inventory space which can quickly fill up with junk, so every bit of extra space can save you from a ton of headaches. You will also want to pick up hacking. Codes and passwords can be found around the station, but some computer terminals and doors can be accessed only via hacking. Abilities are upgraded through Neuromods, with the cost increasing with each subsequent tier upgraded. While Neuromods are hard to come by in the early game, like most items they can be fabricated. Crafting is very simple in Prey. You dump your junk into a recycler, take the resulting materials to a fabricator and craft whatever item or weapon you want, as long as you have the fabrication plan for it. You find fabrication plans by exploring the station. Exploration is really the heart and soul of Prey. There are so many items to find, rooms to visit, terminals to hack, weapons to upgrade, books to read, audio logs to listen to, and combined with the vertical and non-linear level design, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Prey is like the final boss of FOMO. The good news is that many areas are optional, unless stated otherwise by the quest journal. Recognizing that players may stick to one set of weapons and abilities, Arcane were careful enough as to not gate areas to players who did not specialize in the right skills. There's always more than one way to bypass an area, access a locked room or defeat an enemy. In this respect, the game plays more like a puzzle than a traditional FPS RPG or whatever you want to call it. This takes us back to the glue cannon. You can use it to create platforms and stairs to access areas that normally require certain abilities and tools. If you're short on spare parts or you haven't invested any points into repair, you can shoot these big balls of space mucus to cover environmental hazards. Prey also encourages players to find creative solutions to overcoming obstacles. Can hack your way into a room? Pay attention to your surroundings and you may find a maintenance hatch that leads there. Or maybe there's no roof, so you can jump straight in. Or why not use your toy gun to activate out of reach buttons and computers? Prey is a reviewer's worst nightmare because for every gameplay mechanic you mention, there are like 10 you are not aware of. You beat Prey thinking you've mastered it and then you watch a YouTube video of someone breaking the game by using some obscure exploit. I hate to call it a thinking man's game, but frankly I can't find a better way to describe it. It's just that the way Prey is designed encourages players to look for creative solutions with little to no handholding. Before getting into what I consider as the best part of Prey, I wanna briefly touch on its downsides. For one, it overstays its welcome. Prey is about 20 hours long, if you take your time, but the third act is chock full of fetch quests that'll have you go from one end of the station to the other just to have a brief conversation with an NPC. Second, the zero gravity levels are absolute dog shit. One of the main quests has you traverse this huge vertical tunnel filled with irradiated debris. This would have been fine if it wasn't filled with robots and exploding aliens. Combine this with the clunky zero gravity controls and you're in for a fucking treat. Thirdly, and lastly, Prey has that unmistakable jank specific to arcane games. If you hadn't come Morgan? I thought... I don't know what I thought. It's good to see you. Is Transtar mounting a rescue operation? I was in fuel storage when, when the fire broke out and everyone began running. But, no, but they weren't see. running from the fire, it was these shapes. Drowning. Now, I had contained the fire and yeah. I was I trying to reach the power the supply when Al, Officer Rose, came and got me out. I'm glad he did. The last thing I want to talk about is world building. You will encounter a lot of bodies throughout the course of the game, but they're not just random loot dispensers. They're real people with their own backstories. People with lives of their own who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. These are people who held grudges, fell in love with each other, plastered walls with posters of their favorite media and had kids missing them back home. They have freaking names for god's sakes. That phantom you blasted without thinking? Well, she was the head of the sales division. That corpse you found in the freezer? She ran a D&D campaign. And she was the lover of the first sane human being you meet. And she likes arcade games. Look, Arcane didn't have to bother to include dozens of audio logs and emails and notes and stuff since many people will miss them. They didn't have to create rich backstories for these people who were long dead before you found their corpses in some nondescript laboratory. 
but they did it anyway, and the world feels more real and authentic as a result. So that's my take on Prey. It has all the hallmarks of an arcane game. Novel gameplay mechanics, great world building and a painstaking attention to detail. I don't know how to end this video, so thanks for watching and as always please consider cons consider consider consider. Can I end it with this? Please consider hitting the like button and subscribing for more content. Yeah, I guess I'll end it with this. I'll see you next time.